grateful to be in this beautiful ashram. What's present for me right now is just all that chanting. And I'm thinking, how could anyone be pessimistic about the future of the world when such a beautiful thing exists? And how could anyone think that this treasure that was uh, developed over thousands of years in India and is finally kind of bursting forth and spreading all around the world, how could anybody think that that was created in vain, um, that it doesn't have a powerful effect on the world that's pretty much invisible from the worldview that I grew up in. Uh, the worldview I grew up in has um, really no uh, rational account for how this could really make much of a difference on this planet. But when I hear it, I know that it does, and I feel gratitude to, um, to this tradition and to um, everybody who's um, carrying it forward. Another thing, another thing that's coming to me now, maybe because um, I'm at an ashram, is this, this uh, little story. This guy uh, who visited me last year, Guy Lieberman, his name is. He's a journalist, you know, he's not um, anybody with, um, you know, great spiritual accomplishments. But he, was, he told me the story. He was 21 years old, and this was in the 1990s. And he was traveling around, backpacking. He's South African, you know, backpacking around Europe and Africa. And he kind of um, fell in with this spiritual teacher who had a huge following back in the 90s um, all over the world. And he was, his main teaching was that the ascension is coming. And he had a very specific date for it in 1995. And all disease would be immediately cured, and everybody, and we'd have to live in in peace. And he had this beautiful vision of what the world was going to be um, on this date in 1995. And Guy Lieberman, he said, he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and became a devotee. And and he, one day he had this dream that he was supposed to go to Zimbabwe, um, and he told his teacher that, and his teacher said, "Yeah, you can go to Zimbabwe, and you know, here's some materials to take with you." Some gave him some photocopies, you know, so you can talk about, you know, you can be my representative there. Uh, and this guy's only 21, you know. So he shows up in Harare, uh, and where there's mostly white people, but, you know, this guy's followers there, a big group of them, a lot of them there. And they, uh, they're treating him like a VIP, and he doesn't know why. Later, it turns out that the, his teacher has told his followers that he is a hidden master, that this young 21-year-old guy is a hidden master, you know, like a divine incarnation. Uh, and, and so these people are, he says, wow, this is good soup, you know, at the dinner, and they're hanging on his every word. And then big, big group, like probably this size, you know, and they're like, please lead us in meditation now. And he's like, I, I don't know anything about meditation. <laughs> and they're, they're like, oh, Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, it's not something that you have to know how to do. Like, this was an incredibly enlightening statement that he made, and, and it was about humility, you know, and beginner's mind, and they were like, wow. And he's like, no, 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 really, I don't know anything about meditation. And that, wow, that even, like, doubles the impact of it, you know? So he leads them in meditation anyway, and it's amazing, you know? And like people are coming up to him and asking him questions, and he's dropping these pearls of wisdom, you know? And people are in tears <laughs> because of the wisdom of this guy, you know? <laughs> and he's like this 21-year-old backpacker. He knows nothing. Um, far less qualified than any of us to be a guru. Um, although actually, maybe that makes him more qualified. Maybe the first qualification is that to be a guru is that you uh, are quite certain that you're not qualified to be a guru. <laughs> Humility, which is, just in case you think this is uh, an exhortation to be humble, I'll just say that if you pursue humility, you just end up with a counterfeit that fools no one but yourself in the end. So don't aspire to humility. But anyway, um, I mentioned this story because
Actually, the reason I was about to give you is a lie. Um, the real reason I mentioned it is just because it came to me and I like it. Um, but <laughs> I can make up a reason. <laughs> I can make up a reason, which is that, um, well, for one thing, it illustrates the power of story. Uh, and also, you know, you, you, you might interpret this as, as the story as kind of, a, you know, evidence of the gullibility of spiritual seekers and so on. But another way to, to look at it is that he was kind of an antenna or a receptacle for the projection of their own wisdom. He mirrored something in them. And because of his emptiness, because of his humility, at least in that moment, uh, he was able to be um, a mirror and a channel for what was in them already. So what this is illustrating is what I'm going to call, uh, it's a little piece of what I'm going to call the new story, which as everybody here knows, as part of a thousands of years old tradition, it's not actually a new story. It's a very ancient story. But it's new for, for us, for our, uh, for our civilization, our meaning the dominant culture. The name I give to that story is uh, interbeing. Maybe mythology is a better word than story for it, because what I'm talking about, well, really, the, the overarching theme here and what my work is about, it's about the transition in our culture's mythology from a story of separation to a story of reunion or interbeing. I like to use the word interbeing more than oneness because oneness seems to, you know, connote an erasure of difference. But interbeing is more like the story illustrates. It says basically that, that we're not separate, that everything that is in the world is in me as well, that every relationship I have mirrors something in myself, that every judgment I make is a reflection of something hurting inside, that everything happening on this planet is happening to me. This is something I believe that we can feel. You know, why is it that when you read about, you know, 10,000 elephants dying, getting killed every year in Africa, and there might not be any within 10 years, like, why does that hurt? Is it because you've made some implicit rational calculation that your well-being will be damaged, that you will suffer some kind of economic loss, that the biosphere will be less healthy and therefore your rational self-interest will suffer? No, it hurts because it's happening to you. We, and so we recognize that on a heart level. But the logic that we've grown up in does not recognize that, the logic of, of separation which puts heart and mind in conflict. The transition that we're going through now is a transition in our mythology, in the answers to the deep questions that human beings ask, like, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, what's important in life? What's real? How does change happen? Um, what is the purpose of humanity on Earth? Where do we come from? Where are we going? These kinds of questions are answered by a mythology, and the answers that we've had have been based on a mythology of separation that says who you are is a separate individual in a world of other. You're this kind of bubble of psychology, you know, there you're this consciousness or the soul or the spirit inside a prison made of flesh. Or you can dispense with the soul and spirit part altogether and say you're kind of an automaton programmed by your genes to maximize reproductive self-interest, or you're an economic man uh, and seeking to maximize rational self-interest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of these are different versions of the story of separation. And in that story, the universe outside of ourselves is just a bunch of stuff. Uh, a whole bunch of masses bouncing around according to mathematical laws. They don't care about you. They're indifferent to your well-being and they bear no intelligence of their own. Therefore, well-being comes through controlling these external forces. And the story of the people that's part of this mythology says that, that this, that humanity is coming to con better, becoming better and better at controlling uh, and, and harnessing 
uh, these hostile or indifferent external forces. We started out primitive and helpless, and then we developed the wheel, and then we developed fire, mixing this up a bit, and this and that and the other thing, and then it was vaccines, and then it was, you know, uh, the, uh, then the, the you know, nuclear power, and now it's nanotechnology and bioengineering, and, the, and who knows where it'll take us next. Who knows what natural limitations we will overcome and what we will conquer next. And so you can see that war is built into this worldview, competition, Hostility is built into this worldview because if we are all separate selves in a world of other, then more for you is less for, less for me and your well-being is contrary to my well-being and that's just the way it is. And if you go against that, you are contradicting biology and rationality and self-interest. Therefore, altruism, generosity and so forth, they are irrational. They are not of this world. That's why we come to an ashram to practice them and, and why spirituality has this otherworldly association. In fact, the word spirituality is kind of defined in contradistinction to materiality. That is another division that has to end right now, just like the conflict between heart and mind, which is born of the uh, obsolete logic of separation. Also, the uh, division between materiality and spirituality has to end because because it's it's um, an expression of separation. It says that that the qualities that make something sacred are not present in matter. The the up until recently, religion, and I'm not talking actually so much about esoteric religion at all. Actually, um, and the esoteric core is much closer to the surface in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism than it is in uh, the Abrahamic religion religions. But Anyway, you know, religion has said, yeah, uh, science, yeah, you're right. You know, the, the, the universe is just a bunch of stuff. It doesn't have intelligence, doesn't have consciousness. But there's this external thing that brings sacredness into dead, inert matter. Like that's been kind of the, the way that, that many people and institutions have tried to explain our experience of the sacred. They say, well, it must be this external thing. The problem with that, though, is that in that mindset, we treat matter as if it were not sacred, and that's what's happening on this planet. So right now, we, I, I, we're approaching an age of reunion where spirit and matter unite, heart and mind unite, money and the sacred unite. There are so many different uh, expressions of the same movement. And I think that probably everybody in this room, in one way or another, is a servant of the new story the new and ancient story of interbeing. Living a life that doesn't make sense in the story of separation, that you can't justify in its terms. This isn't just a philosophy. You know, I'm not... Um, that interested in just a philosophy because I find that as we stand more and more firmly in the new story, the story of interbeing, our um, thoughts, our speech, and our actions change and we become much more effective as change agents in this world. Part of the story of separation <clears throat> This came up um, in some of the uh, some of our workshops in mine and and also in John's um, is despair. In my workshop, there was the one woman, um, you know, was speaking of her uh, work in the small town in uh, in in um, Canada. You know, and just like the level of oppression and misery suffered by the the young people who have, of native background, you know, who grow up with, you know, drugs all around them, addiction, you know, stealing cars, you know, getting incarcerated, you know, some of them were born in jail, you know, and just like her um, labors seem like such a tiny drop in the bucket, you know? Maybe she works so, so hard and only visibly impacts just a very few people in this enormous 
inhuman system, and that's just one town, you know? Like, look at all the things happening on this planet. And then in John's um, uh, session, then, then another woman, basically, she asked about, you know, how do we stop violence and it's such a big scale and stuff, but really what she was asking, what I heard underneath the question was, am I doing enough? In the story of separation, you are not doing enough and you can't do enough. In a world governed by force, in a world that doesn't have its own intelligence, in, the world, in a world where you are separate from everything out there, then your, your power to affect reality is limited by the amount of force at your disposal. That's Newtonian mechanics. And guess what? You're just one person. You don't have very much force at your disposal. Even if we all banded together, we don't have as much force as the military, industrial, pharmaceutical, agricultural, financial complex. <laughs> they've got the guns, they've got the media concentration, they've got the surveillance state, you know, they've got the, they've got the money, you know, they've got the force. Money is a kind of force. You know, it allows you to make people do things that they don't w actually want to do in our system. So if, if you're in that logic, if you accept its terms of reality, then it's hopeless. But again, that logic goes against what we know in our hearts. And this is why I call my book, The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know is Possible, because our minds do not know it's possible. Elaine and I were talking about this, and she told the story. I'm not going to tell the whole story, because that's, she's going to play off it tomorrow, but um, where, where she, you know, gave, she was speaking, and she gave the audience a list of all these things you can do to make a change. You know? And someone asked, and I might be distorting the story already, someone asked, well, that's a lot of things, you know, and I don't see a lot of people doing them. Is it possible? I mean, really, is there any hope? You know, are we going to make it? And she said, I don't think so. Honestly, I don't think so. And you know what? Like, I don't think so either a lot of the time because what I think is so programmed by the logic I grew up in by the story of separation that I was deeply educated in and that surrounded me. I mean, it surrounds us in a million different ways. For example, by, you know, in the economic system. It's that the economic system, our money system, says essentially that you are in competition with everybody else for never enough. We actually live in a world of abundance, not scarcity. But the experience of scarcity, one in seven children in America going to bed hungry each night, maybe even more than that worldwide, you know, the experience of scarcity, even among the 85 most wealthy individuals that John Perkins was talking about, that, that they experience scarcity too. It's ubiquitous and it's artificial. We waste more than enough food in the West to feed all the hungry people. They're not suffering, the, the world does not suffer a lack of food. It's distribution mostly caused by a lack of money, and money is something that we could create in unlimited quantities. It's just numbers, you know? But money is created um, as artificially scarce, and I'm not gonna go into this whole thing too much, but essentially because it's lent into existence as interest-bearing debt, so there's always more debt than there is money, so we're always in competition for never enough. They, they even did a, um, like, if anything, wealthy people have a greater experience of scarcity than everybody else. They did a survey, Boston College did a survey of wealthy people. To, to enter the survey, you had to have net worth of, I think, $25 million. And the average was something like $70 million. And they asked people a bunch of questions, and one of them was, do you have financial security? <laughs> $25 million or more. The majority said no. How much do you need to have financial security? And they named, on average, a number, something like, you know, 25% more than they already had. If $25 million isn't enough, then how much is enough? No amount is enough. And this was recognized by Aristophanes over 2,000 years ago. He said, the man who has, what is this thing called money, you know? The man who has 30 drachma wants 60. The man who has 60 wants 100. It's not like anything else in the world. Anyway, artificial scarcity.
Hart's logic. Yeah, because in those moments where we're doing these tiny acts, helping you know, one person, um, taking care of a, of a, of a handicapped child, uh, playing music for a dying person even, those small moments of compassion and care, like really hearing a friend. In our hearts, we can feel this is a significant act. And our minds say, well, yeah, maybe if, if you know, I, it goes viral. Maybe if I can scale it up. John gave some beautiful examples last night, you know, like, and he said, all of us can be like Rosa Parks. All of us can be like Rachel Carson. And I don't think that he was saying we can all become famous like them and influential on, um, a, a, on a measurable scale. He's saying that we all have the capacity to do what they did because what they were doing was actually very small um, in any measurable way. You know, it was sitting and writing a book. It was moving from one part of the bus to another. The significance of those acts in the story of interbeing does not depend on them becoming well-known, viral, or influential in any measurable way. Because when we accept that what happens in one place is happening everywhere, that any change in me reflects a change in the world, then we know that every act has cosmic significance. Rupert Sheldrake explains this in terms of morphic resonance, which says any change that happens in one place creates a field of change that allows that same change to happen more easily everywhere else. So to me, this is one um, counter uh, to the story of despair. It, morphic resonance or, or the story of interbeing says to my heart, yeah, you're right. This is significant and you can trust that feeling, even if your rational mind can't say how it's gonna make a difference on this planet. In the face of climate change, how is it gonna make a difference if fewer uh, Native American kids are going to jail in a small town in Saskatchewan? You know, like, we, we don't know. And I'm not saying that we should you know, abandon collective action, political action, and just focus on the small things. That when I say that, the, or, I mean, the theme of this is something like the, you know, the change coming from within, peace coming from within. What's true is that the more we listen to that call of compassion, care, love, the more we stand in interbeing, the more that we understand that you're not separate from me, that what I do to the world, I do to myself, the more we do, we, we take action on every level. The same woman who maybe has cultivated the courage of, of taking care of, of children um, with love or sick people or something like that her whole life, she's also gonna be much more likely to be the one who steps in front of the tank uh, when the moment comes uh, for an eruption of people power. It, all of these things come from the same place. And that's why I believe that the work that goes on in a place like this is just as important as anything that's happening on a political level. We're all part of the same movement. We're all part of the same uprising. We're all part of the same uh, transition in our, in our stories. And I'll just say a little bit about, I'll give maybe a couple little stories um, <clears throat> to illustrate how powerful it can be to stand in the story of interbeing. Because the, 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 the story I told at the beginning actually uh, illustrates this a bit. You know, when, when people were holding Guy Lieberman in the perception of he's this uh, hidden master, he began to play the part of a hidden master. What would be the power? So, the story of separation, so say we want to you know, change corporate behavior or something like that. The story of separation offers us um, 
a frame for doing that, offers us uh, a strategy. And it's based on the story of self that says human beings are fundamentally self-motivated, greedy, selfish, maximizing their own self-interest. And, and, and they don't care. So you go up to the corporate executive during your direct action uh, protest intervention and, and, and how do you make him do something that you know he doesn't really want to do? Well, you have to exercise some kind of force. In this old story, change happens when a force is exerted on a mass. So you have to force him. Well, how do you do that? Could be through the, f the force of guilt or shame, or you can say, you know, your bottom line will actually be better if you uh, in adopt this environmental policy because you'll get good PR. Um, and if you don't do it, we're gonna sue you and we're gonna shame you and, and your children are gonna die on a suffocating planet. And so we can try to scare him or bribe him into changing. That naturally generates resistance. And when he doesn't go along with it, you're like, yeah, see, you know, what a jerk. You know, what a, what a self-interested, uh, uh, you know, greedy person you are. And it's a rep recipe for failure because, again, we don't have enough force. And, well, compare that with the power of, of standing in interbeing and saying, I know you. You're like me. You're under tremendous pressure by the system that you're in to make the wrong decision, but I know that deep down you really care about this planet and you are here for the same reason I'm here, which is to express your gifts toward that which is beautiful to you, to that, toward that which is meaningful to you. You are a being of love fundamentally. If you can hold that story, you'll invite that person into that story. Um, I met this Afghan woman, Sakina, her name is. Uh, she does work with, uh, maybe, some, maybe a couple people in the room might know her. Those, um, I know there's a few of you who do like work with women and, and um, peace work and stuff. And she educates girls in Afghanistan, which is dangerous work. Uh, she gets death threats regularly. And in Afghanistan, a death threat is something to be taken rather seriously. So she's, one day she's in her car uh, and there's uh, her, her two staff members, her driver and her bodyguard who's unarmed. And they, 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 they're, all of a sudden there's a makeshift roadblock and fundamentalists, bearded young men pointing guns at the car. And they say, send Sakina out, we wanna talk to her. And the driver rolls down the window and says, she's not in this car, you have the wrong car. And they say, oh no. We've been following her. We know she's in that car. Send her out. And the people in the car are, are you know, basically wetting their pants in fear because they think they're all going to be killed. Sakina gets out, walks up to them and says, I'm Sakina. What do you want? So everyone's, they're sitting in the car and they're, there's a conversation going on. And half an hour later, she comes back into the car and she says, okay, yeah, we can go. Well, what happened? Well, it turns out that the young men have decided that really what they want is to be educated also, just like the young girls. And they've arranged to meet at, outside the mosque, you know, twice a week. And a couple years later, half of them have become educators as well. How did she do that? She was able to do that because she refused to step into the story that was being offered to her so strongly by the turbans and the beards and the guns. The story that would say, yeah, these are just, you know, vicious terrorists or something like that. Her strength in her story was so strong that she was able to pull them in as well. I know you. So I'm not talking about philosophy here. I mean, I am, but I'm really talking about power. 
because the world is made of stories. Newtonian physics says the world is made of little hard things, objects. That's obsolete physics. And other cultures have known that the elements of reality are not objects. Modern physics might call it information. Other cultures called it stories. My friend Bio, Nigerian guy, he's, he, he was educated in a very Western style but became dissatisfied and he went to seek knowledge from shamans in, in Nigeria. And one of them, he quotes, he says, the world is not made of facts. There are no facts, there are only stories. Which runs counter to our story, the dominant story. So I'm not talking about, this isn't just philosophy, this is world creation. John talks about shape-shifting. One way to understand that is that we step from one story to another. We shift from one story to another, and as we shift stories, we shift selves and we shift realities. And then there's that little voice that says, okay, but you know, I don't see a lot of other people out there doing this. And if reality is created by our stories, well, a lot of people are telling the wrong story, and what does it matter if me, the separate self, changes my story? Well, again, we're back in the logic of separation. But you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing, yeah, like the superstructures of our world, the institutions, the military, the surveillance state, all that stuff, um, and the deluded attitudes that support those things, they seem stronger than ever. But actually, they've become very thin and very fragile. The core has hollowed out. John was talking about this too. You know, he, he's going to business school, speaking to these kids, and not a single one of them now. It's not just the majority. Every single one of them says they want to do something good in the world. You know, they don't want to just maximize their own wealth, which is different from 10 years ago. My friend Polly Higgins, she, go, she goes and talks to, she's an earth lawyer, you know, and she goes and talks to corporate executives and they say the same thing. You know, they won't say it in public, but then afterwards they come up and say, you know, Polly, like this is a coal company executive. He says, you know, I don't, I don't believe in this. I don't think we should be mining coal at all, but I dare not say that. What would middle management tell me? They would kick me out. You know, they would rebel. Meanwhile, you know, you go to middle management and they say the same thing. Yeah, I, 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 this, my heart isn't in this, but I need the money, I need the job. When we try to identify the culprit, the bad guy, we can't find one. You know, you can trace it um, back to corporations, but then you, 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 know, you probe in the corporations, and like John was saying, you can't find the bad guy there either. He said maybe it's Phil Knight, you know, but, but you were talking about, what was his name, Mark, Mark uh, Parker. Parker, yeah. You know, and, and you're saying like, he needs these letters so that he can go to Phil Knight and say, you know, we've got to change our policies about sweatshops. Um, and Phil Knight, you know, is he the one who's really stopping this? Or is it the board of directors? Or is it the shareholders? Or is it the pension funds that are the largest shareholders? Or is it all of us who are seeking to get a better deal well, why are we seeking to get a better deal? Maybe we are barely making ends meet. Maybe we're under the same pressure that everybody else is. Maybe we are all participants in a system that doesn't work for anybody and that nobody actually believes in anymore. So I see the core hollowing out. I see that even the elites don't believe their own propaganda. Very much parallel to uh, what happened in the Soviet Union in uh, uh, the 60s. Well, in the 60s, Khrushchev said, we will bury you. The elites totally believed in the superiority of socialism. And, and Khrushchev wasn't exercising bravado. He really believed it. You know, our system is so superior. By the 80s, 
the institutions of the Soviet state were just as strong as ever. But not, no one believed in them, not even the Kremlin, not even the elites. Nobody believed in it anymore. And that meant that when the time came, it disintegrated overnight. And I'm seeing that happen today too, but we're still holding on really tightly to it because we're afraid of that space between stories that comes when the old story breaks down and the new story has not yet taken shape. And that's where our civilization is right now. And that's where a lot of us are individually too. The old world fell apart. The new world hasn't been born yet. Or maybe we see it emerging through the fog and we catch a glimpse of it here and there. But many of us are in that space between stories where we don't know who we are. We don't know what's true. We don't know what's real. We don't know how to navigate our lives. A sacred space, that is. A quote from uh, the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick is coming to my mind in a book, Vallis. He said, to fight the empire, is to be infected with its derangement. This is a paradox. Whoever defeats a segment of the empire becomes the empire. It proliferates like a virus, imposing its form on its enemies. Thereby, it becomes its enemies. As we go through this transition, and step more and more deeply into interbeing and divest ourselves of the programming of separation. This is um, a layer by layer by layer practice uh, process. Each time I think, okay, you know, I've finally gotten out of that story. And then I realize that I'm actually still in it in a much more subtle way. So Referring to this quote that I just recited, one of the deep stories that's part of the story of separation uh, is called the war on evil. And it says that, that the way to create a better world is to defeat the bad guy, defeat the evil force. Many leftists and, and progressives are very much caught up in that story. They've merely substituted the identity of evil you know, instead of terrorism or communism or something like that, now it is, uh, you know, corporate greed or, you know, corrupt politicians or, um, you know, the Koch brothers or Monsanto or something like that. And the idea then, then you're back in the mentality of war, the mentality of force. This is... Uh, an approach to problem solving. And I'm not saying that there's never a time for a fight in this world, that there's never a time to, to apply force. What I'm saying is that our, our received worldview conditions us to apply that in every situation, almost. And that conditioning, I mean, it's everywhere in the culture. You know, almost any action movie, even a children's movie, the plot is there is some terrible problem being caused by an inexplicably evil bad guy. And the solution comes through the total humiliation and defeat of the bad guy, and then the, everything's fine. That's the plot of the Lion King. That's the plot of Avatar. That's the plot of, of, of Snow White. I mean, it's a plot of almost every, not all. Uh, the Lego movie had a different plot. <laughs> I was amazed by that. You know, I was like, oh man, I'm just gonna be sitting through this two hour toy commercial, you know, like I went in with my 10 year old and, um, it was an interesting movie. This is a bit of a spoiler, but if you haven't seen it already, you're probably not going to anyway, so. Um, the bad guy has won in the end. They are at his mercy, and he has a change of heart. That's the only way that our planet is gonna change, that our world is gonna make it. Through a change of heart, how do we create the conditions for that? How do we, in other words, how do we disrupt the story of separation. How do we invite people into the new story? There are plenty of 
I think actually almost any really effective activism, I just want to make sure I'm not going to go over time here. I, want, uh, I think almost any effective activism can be understood as a disruption of the story. I, in my book, I offer one example. I believe it's actually from the Schwar, uh, who at one point, it might have been some other tribe, but they were, they were going in um, with their spears to evict uh, miners and, and gas drillers uh, from, from their, the territory they inhabited. Uh, and at first when I read that, I'm like, oh yeah, maybe force is the, you know, sometimes effective after all. But then I realized that, and they were successful in stopping a lot of these drilling operations. Um, but I realized that they actually didn't win by force. Their spears would be no match for the machine guns and bulldozers and defoliants that the government could and the corporations could wield against them. But what they were doing is they were disrupting the enabling story that said development is going to help the people there. Those natives don't even have schools. You know, poor them. They don't have hospitals. They're gonna, they, their unemployment rate is 100%. <laughs> We're going to bring these good things to them, just like John's job was. <laughs> you know, they're going to love it. And them going in there with their spears disrupted that story. Anything that you do to violate the worldview of separation is a disruption of its story and is a political act. Any act of generosity, of altruism, forgiveness, kindness, uh, those disrupt the story of, of, you know, the world is a bunch of enemies. And, and it's, been, it's taken me a lifetime to see how deeply I am programmed to seeing the world as a bunch of enemies to approaching every social situation with a little bit of fear. How can I make this person like me? How can I uh, you know, be seen as acceptable, as okay? How can I get something from this person? Like this was almost an automatic, not almost, it, it, it was and to a large extent still is like this, this automatic way of being that makes sense in the universe that I was presented growing up. And I'm working hard tomorrow in the in our in the workshop. We're going to really do this. Um, uh, I, I I've been leading this process that that is like really like pretty intense practice um, in seeing through different eyes, through the eyes of gift. Actually, um, in the story of inner being, what's the purpose? In, in the story of separation, the purpose of life is you know to be safe and secure and maximize your self-interest. In the story of interbeing, the purpose of life, if your well-being is connected to my well-being, if the well-being of the planet is my well-being, then the purpose of life, obviously, is to contribute to the well-being of all. It's not irrational. It's not some spiritual thing that goes against the world. That's only true in the logic of separation. That's the purpose of life to give of your gifts. So uh, I've been you know, practicing uh, this, this deprogramming you know, and, and, and to see other people through those eyes and it's just, you know, when I'm in that state, I mean, it's just like walking among gods, you know. And it's an invitation to everybody I meet, when I'm in that state at least, for them to step into that story. Got another friend, um, his name is Pancho Ramos Stierli. He uh, lives in Oakland. He, um, in what most people would say is a bad neighborhood. I visited him a couple times. He's like, yeah, that was a crack house, you know, and we heard gunshots last night. Um, but he's one of the most fearless people I've ever met. He, he, um, so someone told me a story about him, one of his housemates. He was out on the street, and uh, he was getting robbed. Uh, a gang of teenagers, you know, with guns, was was robbing him. 
And just at that moment, a police car, sirens wailing, lights flashing, pulls up, and the gang runs away, and Pancho is saved, right? Well, Pancho runs with the gang, and they all get away, and then they turn to him, and they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. We were robbing you. Why did you run with us? And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. You're my neighbors. You're my brothers, not the police. They're not from here. And the gang members were nonplussed. They didn't really know what to do with this. He had violated their story, seriously violated their story. <laughs> so they walk away, and Pancho follows them. You know, He's walking along with them, and eventually they're like, what do we have to do to get rid of you? He says, you have to shake my hand. And he shakes hands with every single one of that gang. And they are his neighbors now. He says, in 10 years, this neighborhood will be totally transformed. And again, he doesn't have any power that any of us don't have. I hope that that story is a little disruptor, too. I, I crave stories like that, because each one of them says, Charles, you're not crazy. What you've seen, what you've glimpsed is real. And you can live from that. We need that help because we're surrounded by institutions, money institution for one, that tell us that we're crazy. And so we come to places like this. to be reminded of what's true. I still think that, you know, I'm no stranger to what's happening on this planet. And I do think it's gonna take a miracle for us to make it. And that's why I've become interested in miracles. You know, what, what is a miracle? It's something that's impossible from an old story, but possible from a new one. Probably many of you have experienced things. You would, probably wouldn't be here if something hadn't happened to disrupt your story of normal. That's called a miracle. And I've witnessed and heard many, many stories about miracles, things that our material beliefs, our, our physics don't accept, things that our view of human nature doesn't accept. Um, you know, I've witnessed many of these, of these miracles that show me that my pessimism actually is what is irrational. So, five reasons for optimism. One, the beautiful chanting that can't have been brought to this earth in vain. Two, my knowledge that the view of what's real and possible that I grew up in is much too narrow. Three, my understanding that every act has cosmic significance. The understanding of interbeing, of morphic resonance. For the young people that I meet, who just blow me away, who have reached a point, you know, I talked about this yesterday a bit, you know, in, in a year or two that took me 20 or 30 years to in very imperfectly inhabit, and they're already there. And I meet these people, and I cannot be anything but optimistic when I do. And the last one, <clears throat> last one I will maybe demonstrate, got two minutes to do it, um, with your help. So the old story, the old mythology says who you are, a separate self. It says why you're here to survive and reproduce. And it says what you serve, 
which is, again, your separate self. The new story, the new and ancient story, gives different answers. Who you are, a reflection of all that is, the totality of your relationships, why you're here to express your gifts, and for other things too, to play, to love, to know, to be known. What you serve, I call it the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, that which wants to be born. So I'd like to invite everybody just for a minute um, in silence to turn to someone next to you. So you'll need to be in twos here. Just turn, and if it's real inconvenient to do that, then you don't have to, but, but turn to someone next to you and just look at them. Just look, look at their face, just gaze into their face. So turn and look without talking. And as you look, allow the three little mantras that I say to wash over you. I know who you are. I know why you're here. I know what you serve. And I look at these beings, and you can maybe get this feeling too, looking at your partner. How could I be pessimistic when such a being exists? Thank you. <laughs> so I guess maybe we have a few minutes for, uh, should I say something else? I'll tell you a little story, how about that? <laughs> I've got two in mind. Um, uh, how to decide which one would be the most fun to tell right now. Uh, I'll tell the second one. It's, it's in, in my book, so. Um, but it changes a little bit every time. No, no, I'm gonna tell the other one. Uh, I, was, uh, I was speaking one time to a group, a smaller group than this, and I was talking about like how we're so trapped in our habitual ways of doing things. It was kind of playing off this uh, Philip K. Dick quote, you know, like, Maybe we just have to stop sometimes. Maybe we're, we're you know, we need to, to have a little bit more being and less doing. And I was talking about that kind of stuff and, and this guy stood up very agitated and he said, Mr. Eisenstein, how can you say that? If there were a, a child being beaten right there and a woman being raped and a building on fire over there burning with people inside it, you wouldn't be talking about Stopping, being, you'd do something about it. Well, guess what, Mr. Eisenstein? That is happening right out there, but you don't see it because you're so insulated by your white privilege that you don't understand what's happening on, the, in, on this planet. But it's happening. Oppression, injustice, and the world is on fire. 
So stop talking and do something about it. It was a strong moment. And I was politic enough not to uh, point out that he himself was also sitting in this room talking. Um, and I said, I'm about to li lie to you again, actually. Um, this is what I wish I had said, okay? <laughs> but every time I tell the story, it seems more and more like I actually said that. <laughs> so let's just say that I said, I mean, I, I, might have, I might have said something about how speech and action um, aren't so distinct. You know, when we ask President Obama to take action, we are actually, actually asking him to say something or sign something to manipulate symbols. So anyway, but, but the, the crux of it was, you know, our situation isn't like that. If there, were, if, if there were one child being beaten out there, we would know what to do. We would go out and do something about it. You know, we would stop him. If, 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 if we saw a fire over there, you know, in that building, hey, well, there's a little fire. We know what to do about it. There's a fire extinguisher. We can put it out. We know we have our map of reality tells us what to do. But our situation is not like that. It's more like every building is on fire and every tree is on fire and all you have is a little fire extinguisher. What do you do? Do you wade into the inferno anyway, congratulating yourself that at least you're part of the solution, not part of the problem and being a martyr? That doesn't do any good. What do you do? Maybe you have to tell everybody, hey, guess what, everybody? The world is on fire. Let's do something about it. And what happens when they don't listen? What happens when they say, no, if the world were on fire, then look at the news. It wouldn't be about the Grammys, sports, and Kim Kardashian's butt, you know? <laughs> like, you're crazy, you know? Have a drink, have a pill. Uh, what happens then? What happens when you begin to suspect that the way that you're speaking to people is part of the problem? What happens when you just suspect that you're racing around is, is somehow causing the fire to burn even hotter? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when your map of reality, when your theory of change stops working? Then maybe you do have to stop. So here's the story. It's like our situation as a civilization, we're very much like the man who is stuck in a maze, lost in the maze. And he's trying to get out because the maze is getting hotter and hotter. And he's going to die in there if he doesn't get out soon. So he's racing around, hitting dead ends, turning back, going in circles, finding himself once again back at the center of the maze through all of his intense efforts, not getting anywhere. He's back at the, at, back at the beginning. And, and, and a voice says to him, you know, maybe you should just slow down. Maybe you should just stop. And he says, are you kidding me? The only way I will get out is using my two feet. If I stop using my two feet, I will not get anywhere closer to the exit. I have to run even faster. Time's running out. Finally, he's too exhausted. And he, he's, he makes one last effort and he finds himself yet again back at the center. <sighs> he gives up. As his mind quiets, he begins to reflect upon his wanderings, upon his racing around, and he realizes that there's a pattern to the maze that he was running too fast to see, and a pattern to his responses. Every time that he turns right, the next time he turns left, maybe. He's been running the same course, but there are other passageways that he hadn't noticed because he was running too fast, hidden doorways that he was running too fast to see. Hmm. He begins to understand why he's been stuck. The second thing that happens as his breath calms down and his heart slows down, he hears something. It's a beautiful sound, a musical sound, and he realizes that it's been there the whole time but he hadn't been able to really hear it. And for some reason, that song gives him hope. So now he begins to walk very slowly so as not to repeat his mistakes. 
so as not to just enact his old habits. He walks very slowly, guided by his understanding, his newfound understanding of the maze, taking unfamiliar passageways, going through secret doors, entering new territory, making progress. He knows that he's not where he was before, finally. It feels good. But now what? Now he doesn't know how to navigate. His understanding was based on that familiar territory, and now how does he make his choice? He comes to an intersection. Do I go right or do I go left? So what does he do? He listens for that sound, for that music. And he decides, I will choose the passageway from which that music is the most clear and the most beautiful. And so he walks that passageway and he follows that again and again and again until eventually he arrives at the final passageway and there's a light at the end of it and he emerges into a completely different world and finds his lover there who's been singing to him this whole time. I don't know how to get to the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. I don't have a map for it, but I've seen it, and so have you. We know that there's a there there. Sometimes we see it like a mountaintop, golden, in those peak experiences, and then we descend into the valleys, into the jungles, the thickets. We don't see it anymore. Maybe we even forget. We barely remember. And maybe that was just a fantasy. Maybe that was just a high. But then we meet somebody else on those pathways. And they say, yeah, I saw it too. And we ascend a little hill together. And there it is again, a little closer. And then we go back down into those pathways. And sometimes, and we listen, you know, for that sound, for that call what draws us, and sometimes what draws us, it looks like we're turning the opposite direction and only after a long wandering do we realize that this was the path after all and it brought us closer somehow. So, we all have a different name for that compass, um, that song could be what makes you feel alive. Could be what's the most fun thing you could do. Could be what would love choose. And here we are together um, at a meeting place amongst all those pathways, all telling each other, yeah, I've seen it too. That's why we're here. Because then when we go forth out of this place, will carry with us that knowledge. And what had seemed so overpoweringly, overpoweringly real will seem a little less real, because we'll remember. And uh, that's, yeah, that's my excuse for being here um, among all of you. So thank you so much for your presence. I know a lot of you have to get up really early and stuff, so I don't know if we want to have like one or two symbolic questions. Just, I, don't, I, need, I need an authority figure to tell me. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm the authority figure, I'm up here. <laughs> yeah. So would anyone like to come to the mic and uh, make a comment or a question? So what did you say to the guy? What I say for real? Yeah. I mean, I said something along those lines, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember, really. <laughs> truth, truth and fact are two different things. Ursula K. Le Guin wrote, um, she said, the truth goes in and out of stories, you know. What was once true is true no longer. The water has risen from another spring. What's, what was once true is true no longer. You know, like when I was a kid, and maybe this was never true, but when I was a kid, 
like America, land of the free and home of the brave, still rang true a little bit. But I don't think that even the conservatives believe it anymore. It's their brand, but they don't really believe it. Mm. The story is hollowing out. Stories have a lifespan, just like anything else. They are beings, you know? Our, our story, story of separation says that anything outside of ourselves doesn't have beingness. John said that the shaman taught him to, to talk to rocks or to, I can't remember exactly what you said, but, but, but you know, that to rephrase it, that rocks have beingness, have consciousness, have subjectivity, that everything in the world does, that we're not alone here. That's something that the story of separation dismisses as a childish fantasy, an anthropomorphic projection, the projecting of human qualities onto inanimate stuff, you know? But I don't think that we're gonna make it without a revolution that goes all the way down to that level, all the way down to how we see the world outside of ourselves. One more little tidbit here. Um, I don't think the questions are really gonna happen now, so I'll just, oh, you have one? Okay, maybe your question will miraculously lead into the tidbit I was gonna offer. Yes, I'd just like to uh, preface my question by saying that I, uh, I agree with everything you say, and I think that uh, essentially I agree that uh, in order for us to make progress, we're gonna have to deal with the incredible uh, imminence of this logic that's seems so self-evident, but it's almost invisible that, that, that dictates the way we think and, or, or dictates maybe our incapacity to think. And uh, my one little question is, um, sorry, a little bit of a sore throat here. Um, when you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, the idea that, I mean, the key sort of academic uh, ideal in, in, uh, in sort of getting, uh, arriving to certainty or anything is, is, is objectivity. And do you think that it's significant that uh, when we do become objective, the only way we, we can do this is by completely eradicating the self and our own heart and our own mind and our own feelings. Uh, do, do you think that's, that's a significant uh, thing? Yeah, I think the successor to objectivity is humility. Um, and, you know, the scientific method, for example, depends on objectivity. And there's something beautiful about the scientific method. It says, we're going to let reality, we're going to let that which is outside of ourselves inform our stories, our beliefs. But, and this is an open question, you know, when we begin, when we understand that what is outside of ourselves mirrors what's inside of ourselves, then what becomes of science? You know, what becomes of objectivity? So, um, yeah, I mean, I could go into a whole thing about, you know, deconstructionism and, and, and what's real and stuff, but I think I won't for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, the beautiful piece of objectivity is humility, getting out of the way. Um, yeah. I'll say say that little last thing, um, and then then we'll say goodnight. The uh, I got a letter from this guy in Australia who described this political direct action that they did to stop fracking. And they had, at first they were being very oppositional, you know, and, and um, you know, they were occupying drilling sites, you know, and they were, they were trying the usual tactic of activism, which is to arouse as much hatred and indignation toward the evildoers as possible, hoping that the eruption of public anger will overcome them through force. And it wasn't going to work because the government had, had organized 800 heavily armed police that were going to invade the camp in a couple days, disperse them, and protect the drilling rigs to 
you know, proceed with their fracking. Um, and so they decided to change their tactics completely. And they said, you know, we can't win this. We're gonna have a party instead. And they got out, there were, there were indigenous people there, they got out the didgeridoos and the clapping sticks, you know, and they drew this gigantic, I mean, there were like armed drones coming in. They drew this gigantic uh, like piece of art that was visible from the sky, you know, and it turned into this, to this, to this festival, which somehow made it impossible for the police, like they, they couldn't invade a festival, you know, and they, they, and they called off the invasion and, the, and then the government uh, initiated a corruption investigation on the gas company that was going to drill there, and they won. And he said, and so, and they were celebrating, you know, and, and one of the uh, aboriginal elders was, she was just so overjoyed, and she said to him, the reason you won is because you stepped away from conflict, and that's what allowed the spirit of the land to take charge. Because when you're in conflict, when you're trying to control things, I mean really, war is about control. It's the story of control. Goodness, well-being comes through control, taken to its extreme. When you control things, then there's no space for the synchronistic, for, the, for, the, for grace to come through. But you let go. And the spirits of nature took charge. And you cannot lose when you do it that way. So again, thank you, and I'll see you tomorrow.